Okay, so now we can start. So as I was saying, uh, Emilio's background is very extensive, so I'll take a while to you know like read all his CV. So here's just a you know, short uh, summary. Um, expert on uh, theoretical uh, physics and cosmology. He did his PhD at uh, UV here in Barcelona, University of Barcelona. And he did a uh, he had a Humboldt Fellow in Hamburg and in Berlin. Uh, sorry, a Humboldt Fellow and a Self Fellow in Japan. Uh, and he also you know, visited many institutes, many universities. He was a, a visitor, researcher in Penn State, uh, MIT, Harvard, Trento University, and many others. Uh, he has also written uh, a few books, right? Um, well, he's the head of the department of the theoretical, sorry, head of group of the theoretical physics and cosmology group here at, uh, at ESEN, and also part of EEC. So yeah, I think that's a nice introduction. So. Take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction. If you don't mind, I'll be sitting because I don't have spectacular things to show. Minimize this, so it's... Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, Albert Einstein visited Spain only once, and this happened exactly 100 years ago. This fact has been celebrated and reported in the local media in considerable detail during the last couple of months. Probably you will have already heard about it, but some aspects of Einstein's visit went unnoticed. I am going to emphasize them here, namely the important social and scientific circumstances surrounding his visit. They were the first to come to my mind after thinking for a while when a journalist came to my office begging for information about Einstein's stay in Barcelona. <laughs> what on earth would I tell him that had not been said in the piles of local chronicles already? <laughs> I started to think, 1923. Eh? Different things happened this year. Friedman, equations, for instance. This is the first thing that came to my mind. Equations for the universe, an unbelievable milestone, because for 10 years, for almost, for more than 10 years, nobody believed in these equations. They were no use. Also, I will tell about the historical, social, and economical context of this year. There was the hyperinflation in Germany, the Munich Putsch, Hitler in jail, and Einstein lived Germany for six, almost six months, visiting different countries, and then came to Spain. But the most important thing is the Einstein-Friedman controversy that happened that year. What had Einstein done by 1923? Everybody will remember about 1905. 1905 was the Anus Mirabilis of Einstein. Where he was 25 years old and working in Baron's patent office, there working there, just you know, without any instrument, without nothing, without any help from anywhere. He wrote four extraordinary momentous and innovative articles that year one on the theory of photoelectric effect, another on Brownian motion, another on the theory of special relativity and a fourth one on the mass energy equivalence, although this formula did not appear in that, uh, the, the formula did, did not appear in that paper. It was all, 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 only, it was only implicit there, and not explicitly given there. Well, in 1915-17, in this, he, he did these presentations in the Prussian Academy of Sciences that were in the introduction of this talk, yeah, that was distributed. One on general, one paper on, on general uh, theory of relativity and, and the other on the cosmologische Betrachtungen. Yeah? So the con uh, cosmological considerations, the application of his equations to, to cosmology. Well, he already said that, uh, presented this verifiable evidence that his theory was correct. Anomalous perihelion precession of Mercury, deflection of light in gravitational fields, 
and the gravitational redshift. And in 1915, Einstein, already using his equations, calculated in an approximate way because he was not able to find an exact solution what Schwarzschild did the same year, but he was not able, but working approximately, he calculated the anomalous precession of Mercury's perihelion, and, and the result was right, you know, for fitting. And he was so happy, so happy. He told his friend Beso, and, and he became absolutely convinced that his theory was true in that year, 1915. Not in 1919, yeah, that the explosion of relativity, you know, and the, the observation of the solar eclipse this year convinced everybody, everybody starting with journalists everywhere in the world, you know, that published chronicle that Einstein had gone farther than Newton, an impossible dream. Who could go farther than, farther than Newton? It was impossible, and Einstein had done it. Yeah. And a journalist approached Einstein and said, well, what would have happened if the results of the solar eclipse hadn't proven your theory? What would have happened? And he said, in that case, there should have been a mistake either in, in, the, observ in the observation or in the interpretation of the results because I am convinced that my theory is true. That was his answer. <laughs> so <laughs> he was completely convinced that his theory was true <laughs> already from 1915. Well, now let's see the principles of general, uh, the general theory of relativity. Those principles are so basic and elementary that the, the astonishing thing is that with so elementary principles, you obtain such a theory and such important consequences. This is, this is astonishing not the principle themselves. What says the first principle, relativity principle? It only says, this just says, that it has sense to speak of physical laws. It has sense. What does it mean? It has sense. It has sense means that there is a law, physical law that is valid here in Madrid, in Berlin. If I am, on board of a train, on a spaceship, or I am in the moon. The same law is valid. This is the first principle. So it has sense to speak of physical law. The law is exactly the same. Only the expression, the mathematical expression of the law yeah, in terms of a formula changes eh, from place to place and from system to system, but the law is the same. This is the first principle. And this principle is not due to Einstein. It's due to Galileo Galilei, who in 1632, in his famous work, Dialogo Supra i Due Massimi Sistemi del Mondo, eh? el, sistema, el Sistemis eh, Copernicano eh? e Ptolemaico, eh? Copernicano e Ptolemaico. In words of Salvati, the second day of these dialogues, Galileo states the principle of invariance. The laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference systems. With these words, yeah? So you are already silent, yeah? <laughs> but Galileo himself is speaking here. Lock yourself up with a friend in the main cabin under the deck of a rather large ship and bring with you flies, butterflies, and other small flying animals. Hang a bottle so that it drains drop by drop into a large container below. Make the ship go at the speed you prefer, but always the same, a smooth motion without fluctuations in one direction or the other. The drops will fall into this container without being deflected aft, even if the ship has moved forward, forward, while the drops are still in the air. The butterflies and flies will continue their usual flight from side to side, as if they never tire of following the course of the ship, however fast it may go. And it will never happen that they concentrate at the stern of it. So a beautiful description <laughs> of this principle. You see, you see this is a, such an elementary thing, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, well, then adding to this principle, Galilean principle, yeah, without any uh, uh, without any change, adding the fact, proven fact yeah, that this that the speed of light is constant. Yeah? It was proven by Michelson and Morley. There was no other. Adding these two things. Just with these two principles, Einstein obtained the special theory of relativity. And the first thing he did was to derive Lorentz and Poincaré transformations. Those transformations were known already since 1887. They were in use, yeah, these transformations. He derived these transformations from these two principles, giving full meaning to them. Yeah, so these transformations, they don't come from there, no. They come from this, exactly come from these two principles, natural. Well, one is a, a, a natural principle because if there are no laws, we cannot start to speak, you know? So let's stop. Yeah? And the other was just an observational fact. We don't understand even now yeah, why the, the, the speed of light is constant. I don't know, yeah? but it's a fact. So let's put it here. So with these two principles, all special theory of relativity, the consequences of these two so simple postulates are extraordinary and very difficult to grasp for those of us who always move at insignificant speeds compared to that of light. Simultaneity of two events is relative, time dilation, length contraction, Relativistic contribution to the Doppler effect. You know this very well already, but those are just consequences of these two simple things. And the famous formula E equal to mc squared. Well, nuclear physicists say that this, uh, another, and also other physicists say that this, which is considered to be the most important formula ever written, the most famous formula, no, not important, but the most famous formula ever written. Yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, many physicists say maybe it's not so important, you know, because it doesn't help so much yeah? when you want to, <laughs> to construct a nuclear bomb. <laughs> it doesn't help, you know, it is no help. <laughs> so, but it was helpful, helpful historically, and there is a story by Otto Frisch, very beautiful to read, very beautiful to read about how we're walking in Stockholm with his aunt, Lise Meidna. They understood for the first time in history that the splitting of the atom had taken place. Yeah? In an experiment carried out by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, and they couldn't understand what was happening there. From uranium eh, bombarding with neutrons, they obtained barium. And how was this possible? They had no explanation. And the two of them, they understood the thing using, making use of this formula. Uh, so this uh, historically, is it, it was an important event and it's beautifully explained by Otto Frisch, as I say. Well, now, Adding one more principle, one more principle that occurred to him one day sitting at the patent office in Bern, sitting at the table there. And it was <laughs> explained that it was shocked suddenly because of the thought that he had had at this moment. And the thought was, what would happen if I would be falling, if I would be falling from the roof of my house, upright, falling down? Yeah? You freeze this image, falling down. If I had in my hand some object as a coin or an apple, and I used to say in my talks, Newton's apple. I have Newton's apple here. He didn't say that, yeah, but <laughs> Newton's apple here. And I was falling. If I let them go, the object go, it wouldn't fall to my feet. Wouldn't fall to my feet. It would continue by my hand. By my hand, it wouldn't fall to my feet. Yeah. So gravity would not exist in my 
surrounding while I was falling down from the roof. So he had eliminated gravity. He had eliminated gravity. And he said that this was the glücklichste Gedanken minus 11. Yeah? <laughs> the most uh, marvelous, <laughs> you know, the most happy uh, thought yeah, of my whole life. Well, some people say that <laughs> this sentence he pronounced when he discovered the formula E equal to mc squared. Okay, the, you know, in any case, yeah, in any case. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Why this was so important? Why this was so important? Because this proved that gravity is, is not a special force, huh? a special force is an ordinary force like any other force made by a, a human, an animal, or a machine huh? is the same kind of force. You can eliminate gravity yeah, by moving. In other words, in other words, you know, this object has two masses. Has two masses. One mass is the gravitational mass, the mass that appears in the formula for the gravity attraction. This is one mass, and it it has a different mass, which is the mass when I make a force here eh, and try to accelerate the object eh, is the mass that opposes ac being accelerated yeah, by a force. This is the inertial mass and the other is the gravitational mass. Yeah. Well, the two masses are the same. This is a principle. This is not obvious. No? Of course, it's not an obvious thing. You can, you can take it by obvious. It's not obvious at all. Yeah, and they are still proving, still trying to prove if this is true, if the equivalent principle is true. And this principle is more complicated, you know. I am simplifying a lot. There are three stages yeah, here. Uh, uh, by fortune, Carlos is not here. So, <laughs> you know, because he would be, yeah, you, you know, <clears throat> he would be contributing all the time because, uh, of course, there are three three steps in these equivalence principles. This is the most simple thing. Yeah, this is the most simple presentation. The gravitational force is like any other force. We assume the complete physical equivalence of a gravitational field and a corresponding acceleration of the reference system. This is the equivalence principle. And with these three principles, with these three principles, Plus, you know, some consideration. Of course, there is a simplifying consideration which is very important. We stop here at second order. We stop at accelerations. Yeah, this relativity principle. We don't reach max principle. Yeah, and also making some simplifying mathematical uh, assumptions. Yeah, working hard. For 10 years, for 10 full years, working very hard, Einstein was able to formulate the equations corresponding to these principles. You know, this is the thing that I don't explain. How you do that? Yeah, how do you do that? This is the hard thing. But the principles are those, they are so simple. And there is also the principle in formulating the equations that they should reduce to Newton's laws, which are exactly equally valid as they were before relativity. They are exactly equally valid in the domain, in their domain. Okay, now, uh, I, I, okay, I don't say anything about the equations, yeah, just only that he, he take very long to him to obtain them, and also about the solutions that you can see here, the solution by Schwarzschild that was obtained a few weeks after the formulation of the equations yeah, in the Russian front yeah, by Karl Schwarzschild, and also the solution of Alexander Friedman I will talk later. Of course, Einstein was the first to realize that his equations didn't reflect the whole of Max ideas, the relativity principle in full, 
Yeah, because he stopped at second order. He, he cut at second order. And this makes that even if the postulates first and third are independent, yeah, they are not in the formulation in the equations because of, of this truncation to second order. But Einstein was the first to say that, to say that, that someone will soon come and improve my equations. But a hundred years went and we are now working on the uh, uh, scalar tensor theories, FR theories, and all these things that you have heard here before. Yeah, and it, it has taken so, so long. Yeah. Uh, these equations really try to improve the first, the, the, the first principle, that relativity, when derivatives of higher order are important. When this happens, this starts to happen when space-time is being folded. Yeah? And some observations with very strong gravitational field, this starts to be important. So this will require modification of Einstein's equation. And they are also important, of course, <laughs> we try to go to Einstein's equations to study an atom. Yeah? We try to study an atom and they fail. These equations are not valid. Yeah? They are not better than Newton's equations in this respect. Yeah? Exactly <laughs> equally bad. <laughs> Relativity than Einstein's equations to study an atom. Yeah? So we need, yeah? we need to quantize uh, gravity. We need quantum gravity. We didn't succeed in building quantum gravity, but we have succeeded in making yeah, some, you know, some first other corrections uh, to relativistic equations, to the classical equations. So first order quantum corrections. And it's nice to see that first order quantum corrections and also the other thing that we go to strong gravity, all them both require higher order terms yeah, in, in curvature, derivatives, higher order derivative terms in curvature. So all them require this. We are working on that. Yeah? We are working on that. By the way, there is a very beautiful paper by Wilczek that is already 20 years old, yeah, where he explains all these things. Yeah? that total relativity is not incorporated in general relativity, that Einstein knew already about that, yeah? And Wilczek goes further to make a parallel with the symmetry breaking parad paradigm in the sense that total relativity, total relativity, eh, that was Mach's dream, yeah? total relativity would be the unbroken theory. And those are, so special relativity is broken to first order eh? and, and general relativity is, is broken to second order. You know, it's a very beautiful paper. Yeah. Now, cosmologische betrachtung. In 1917, Einstein applied his general theory of relativity to the universe. And, <laughs> and he could see that it didn't work. So it didn't work to describe the universe because the universe at that time, it was, well, it was just reduced to, to, to the Milky Way, but this is not just the only thing. It was eternal. Yeah? So as a system, yeah, as a system, as a physical system, it would have had a long time in order to, to become stationary, yeah? in a stationary state. Yeah. So and when you reach this stationary state, to apply Newton's or Einstein's equations, and the system collapses immediately, collapses, collapses. So <laughs> he had to introduce the cosmological constant. And this was dedicated to Enrique Gastañaga, who is a fan of Robert Hooke. <laughs> and already Robert Hooke, Robert Hooke introduced this cosmological constant to Newton's equations. And Einstein did exactly the same in his paper, does exactly the same. First, he, he realizes that, it, it, you know, that it, you, you get again the same thing as in Newton's in Newtonian case. And he introduces the cosmological constant to start 
in the new in 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 Newton's equation introduces them in Newton's equation and then later in this following page he does the same in his equations so he introduces in the way Robert Hooke already did Robert Hooke was a genius eh, at the shade of Newton the genius at the shade of Newton there is even some book <laughs> with his title yeah so really genial yeah, ask <laughs> Ask Enrique. <laughs> okay, so he introduced this constant that when it is small enough, then applies to the domains of the solar system, they will give the equations the same result that will be indistinguishable from Newtonian physics. Yeah, and with this, he solved the situation. Yeah, for a while, <laughs> he solved this situation. Well, now the you know the most uh, hard uh, parts of For, for, uh, for Einstein. Yes, well, this is another thing. Yeah, nobody denies this. Eh? Already. Well, know, no, 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 no. He said that the, the Mileva was right. my equal. Yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> she is my equal. Yeah. And, uh, and also. Uh, Yes, sorry about that. I think we're back with that. Yeah, Yo, okay. Later. Yeah, and also... <clears throat> oh, wait, we are not... Sorry. Not mirroring the screen. Also, Marcel Grossman. Also, Marcel Grossman was working for him, so he needed uh, for the mathematics. He needed, and, okay. well, what I will, what I will tell at the end, is another proof that Einstein didn't have so special mathematical abilities, quite on the contrary. And my idea is that if Einstein had had more mathematical abilities, if he would have been better in mathematics, 
then he would have been much worse in physics. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, this is my idea. Yeah, but, but he was always reasoning the physical idea, not the mathematics, eh? not the mathematics. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, in, in 1918, he gives the full amount of the prize to Mileva, as, as I said, yeah. He got the prize in 1922, but it was corresponding to 1921, yeah, because in 1921, Oh, he was already, uh, no, in, in 1921, uh, he was already considered for the prize, but in the end they said, no, but this is theoretical, this is useless, this, this is useless, no connection with, with you know, with real world. And, and in 1922, they thought it twice, no? they reconsidered the case, and they decided to give the prize yeah, for the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect had been experimentally proven by, by Millikan in 1916, and Robert Millikan got the prize in 1923. There was nothing special with that, because you know that also Hawking never got the Nobel Prize. Yeah? Hawking never got the Nobel Prize. So it was the same, exactly the same policy as now. Yeah? It's, it, it has to be something relevant to, <laughs> to the society, no? to the society, some practical, uh, some experimental, yeah? something related to the reality. Okay. Well, but due to hyperinflation in Germany in 1923, capitals suddenly lost all value. Some other things that happened that year, yeah? In January, Juan de la Cierva makes the first flight in his Autogiro. In January also, French and Belgian troops occupied the Ruhr region in order to force Germany to pay the war reparations agreed to in the Treaty of Versailles. In February 23, inflation grows and one dollar is exchanged for almost 60,000 mark. On February 23, eh, the day when Einstein put foot, set foot in, 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 in Spain, eh, the German parliament approves a decree law against speculators. In July, one dollar is changed for 350,000 uh, 350, mark, more than 200 times its value in January. And on November 15, one dollar, this is world record, is exchanged for 4.2 trillion or billion, you know, <laughs> depends on the reference system. Yeah, <laughs> for, for one is trillion, for the other billion. Any, anyway, you work with powers of 10, so <laughs> it's the 12 powers of 10. Papiamar, unbelievable. There are these movies, where you see the workers going to, to, to take the salary at the end of the week with a chart, eh, big <laughs> chart, putting all the salary there for a week. You know, this was... No, one, one has to take this into account. You know, this was this time. Yeah, the visit took place at that time. In the end of 1923 in Munich, uh, the, there was this brewery. Putsch and Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess were sent to prison, and then they started the rise of the, you know, the Nazis uh, short uh, later. Tutankhamon was discovered, uh, the, the tomb, Salvador Segui and Pancho Villa were murdered, and Primo de Rivera inaugurated the first dictatorship in Spain, this in 1923. The visit, Einstein's visit, was in the framework of an escape from Germany. Yeah. When Walter Walter Rathenau was murdered and he knew uh, that Einstein was also in a list, yeah, the, he was in a list, he decided to escape from Germany for a while. And he collected all the invitations he had got yeah, to visit different places in Asia and uh, Palestine and in Spain, they had uh, two invitations from Spain, one from Barcelona, Madrid, and the other from the University of Zaragoza, and he and, and uh, he he decided to leave. Yeah, he decided to leave. 
these travel diaries are very nice to read, very nice to read. They go from October, the 6th of October, 1922, to the 12th of March, 1923. It starts in this way, 6th October. This is the first line of the day. Night trip in Oberfield train after reunion with Beso and Chavan, lost wife at Borda, and so on. And sunrise shortly before arrival in Marseille. Beautiful, beautiful writing, yeah? detailed. Yeah, and 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 the last the last words uh, in 12 March. It was not the end of the trip. It was the day when he arrived to Zaragoza, and from Zaragoza he came back to Berlin. Yeah, in in Zaragoza the last three I don't have them here, but this stop at Zaragoza. Three words: stop at Zaragoza. <laughs> the, the last line of this diary on 12 March. It's nice, yeah? as I said, to read these these travels uh, mainly in Asia. It was, uh, you know, it was received in such a way. Some sometimes he said that nobody, nobody, no living person was deserving this kind of reception as 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 he had in Japan, with thousands of people there greeting him. And it was an exceptional thing, yeah, in in in, in Japan specifically, yeah. And it's nice. Yeah? It's nice, as I said, to read to, to read this. Well, in Catalonia, he came through an invitation. It was uh, one invitation, but to visit Barcelona and Madrid. And the invitation was signed by Esther Terradas and Julio Rey Pastor, a mathematician in Madrid. And they offered him 7,000 pesetas, which was the double annual salary of a professor to give lectures in Barcelona, three lectures in Barcelona and three lectures in Madrid, if I remember well. <clears throat> and he also got an invitation, a different invitation from Zaragoza, and then he stopped in Zaragoza also to give a lecture. Well, when he was, uh, when he came back from this long trip from Palestine and the ship was in Marseille, he had difficulties to send, because he had big luggage from this six month, uh, six month uh, journey, he, he had he had a big luggage, and they wanted to send this luggage directly to Berlin or uh, to Zurich, and they had many problems. So so they didn't know exactly what train were they taking to come to Barcelona, and nobody went at the station to collect him, to you know, to meet him at the station. <laughs> and then the people, colleagues from Madrid, they say, oh, in Barcelona, nobody came <laughs> to meet Einstein at the station. But this is the reason. And as nobody was there, then Einstein went to look for a hotel and he went to, well, his is the diary. Eh? His, this, this is the diary where he, 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 he explains this thing, yeah, that, that when he arrived at the... Uh, and, then, and then he went to, to, a, to a modest hotel, to a modest hotel, Cuatro Naciones, eh? Hotel Cuatro Naciones, which is at the end of the Ramblas, in Rambla Santa Monica, when you go down to the left, the Hotel Cuatro Naciones, and and well, but it, it was a modest hotel that he found. But then the owner immediately he didn't spend even a night there because the owner, when he knew that Einstein, that who was Einstein, he said, "No, this is not for you. You should go to a better hotel." And, and the owner sent him directly to Colon. It doesn't exist. There is an hotel Colon, but it's not this hotel Colon. Hotel Colon was in the corner of Plaza Catalunya with uh, Paseo de Gracia, at this corner. At this, at this uh, former Hotel Colón was very, it, was, it, it played an important role during the war in Spain, you know, it, it played an important role, this Hotel Colón. So he was in this Hotel Colón. <coughs> we, we know the, the, the amount was paid by the, by the city council in Barcelona, the amount. 883 pesetas in all. Hotel Colón was 692, but then there were meals, there were uh, buckets of flowers and other things. And also the Real Academia de Ciencias y Arts de Barcelona 
also paid him 500 pesetas, <laughs> more, more, more. Okay, well, he was, he was, he was here. Yeah, there are a few lines eh, describing his visit in, in Barcelona. And this is the most iconic picture, the most iconic picture with these nine children. Yeah. And the children were not attracted because Einstein was such a figure, yeah, an important person. They were attracted by the automobile, you know, this car, the car he was traveling with. Yeah, this was a really special car, car from Casa Elizalde, yeah, from Casa Elizalde, Type 29 Torpedo. It costed 33,000 pesetas at the time. To compare, you know, what can pay him? What was the price? <laughs> the car costed 33,000 pesetas. Yeah. Okay. Well, from the travel diary, we know, I, 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 I read, eh? I went to the travel diary because I, I, I did this directly, you know, because if, it, if you go to what journalists write and so, yeah, you, you shouldn't be very confident because they, they make many mistakes and they said things that are not rigorous, you know, that sometimes are not right. Well, uh, in the diary, you see that Einstein was occupied with physics questions when he was in the ship. Eh? And on October 9, he says that he has he, he, he was reading Ernst Kretschmer's book, Physics and Character, and Henry Bergson's book on relativity, and compares the approximations from Riemann and Weil to the program to the problem of unification of gravity with electricity. He was working with this for, for a lot of, of, of time. Yeah, without success. Yeah. So this is the thing that he was doing. But the really important thing that happened at that time was Friedman, yeah? Friedman equations. Friedman was a professor at St. Petersburg Mining Institute, a technical institute, you know, not even a university, but he had mathematical interest. And already in the end of 1920, he had written a letter to Ehrenfest. Yeah? Ehrenfest. Ehrenfest had been in, in St. Petersburg, and he knew Russian, yeah? and he wrote the letters in Russian, telling him that he had already obtained some simple solutions of Einstein's equation. And in 1922, in another letter, he says that he has obtained a solution with, for a possible universe with curvature radius that varies with time yeah? in Russian. This was never published. Yeah? And Aaron first sent it to a mathematician, Schouten, and he didn't pay much attention. It was not so important. But later, it turns out, later I discovered that Schouten and, 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 and Friedman had collaborated in some paper. This was years, years, uh, a bit later. Well, so he decided uh, to send his findings to Zeitschriftia Physik. And the paper was received in June 29, 1922. He said, the case of a variable universe admits, on the other hand, a large number of possible situations. Situations are solutions. In some cases, the radius of curvature of the universe increases steadily with time. And there are other situations that correspond to a radius of curvature that changes periodically. Hmm? Einstein analyzed Friedman's paper quite quickly. And the note was received, you know, this was before the trip, you know, this was before the trip. Now we are in 1920, 1922. Yeah, this was around, yeah, before the trip. And the note of Einstein was received in Sagirsia Physic in September 18, 1922, few weeks before embarking for this six month trip. And he said, as for the non-stationary universe, the result contained in the work seemed suspicious to me. In fact, the solution give, given for this case turns out not to satisfy the field equations. <laughs> this is, what, this is all, all this is kept. Yeah, is, I, I will show you some excerpts later. Friedman learned of Einstein's criticism through his friend Yuri Krutkov, who was visiting in Berlin at that time. And on December 6, 1922, Friedman wrote a letter to Einstein answering all his objections. This was 
after Einstein had left, because he left on October 6, eh? and this was December 6, 1922, two years after Einstein had left for history. When Friedman's letter arrived in Berlin, Einstein had already left. Even when he wrote the letter, when, when Friedman wrote the letter, <laughs> Fried, uh, Einstein had already left. Well, in the letter, Friedman tells Einstein, given that the possible existence of a non-stationary universe is of interest, I would like to present the, here the calculations I have made so that you can verify and critically evaluate them. Then he provides the details of all the mathematical operations. If you find the calculations I present in this letter to be correct, please be so kind as to inform the editors of the editors of Scientific Physique about the conclusion. Perhaps in that case, you yourself would like to post a correction to the statement you made, or at least give me a chance to post the operation part of this letter. <laughs> Well, this is the letter that Friedman wrote to Einstein. Yeah? Einstein didn't get it. And even when he returned in, in, in March 23, he returned. But two years passed and no reaction from Einstein. We don't know if Einstein didn't read the correspondence or he saw it but say, wow, well, oh, again, this, <laughs> this guy here saying about the solution, and he didn't pay attention. But the fact is that in May 1923, in May 1923, eh, after the return of Einstein to Berlin in March, yeah, in May, Krutkov, the friend of Friedman, who was moving in, 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 in Germany, eh, then, and Einstein meet in Leiden. Yeah? because Hendrik Lorenz retires. And then they meet in Ehrenfeld's home. Ehrenfeld was appointed Lorenz's successor in the cathedral. And so it was <laughs> Lorenz's successor. And, and they, they met there. And the result of the discussions, we know from two short paragraphs in Krutkov's letters to his sister in St. Petersburg. In the first, he says, on Monday, May 7, I was with Einstein reading Friedman's article of Scientific Physics in detail. In a second letter written on May 18, he states, I have defeated Einstein in the argument of Friedman where Petrograd's honor is saved. You see, so Einstein was not <laughs> very good at mathematics. Yeah, this is another proof here. We have <laughs> real proof here. Yeah. And Einstein writes a note in Scientific Physique where he retracts. In my previous note, I criticized Friedman's work on the curvature of space. However, a letter from Mr. Friedman, which I got through Mr. Krutkov, convinced me that my criticism was based on an error in my calculations. Now I consider that the results of Mr. Friedman are correct and they bring new light and continues. It is shown that the field equations together with the static solution also admit dynamic solutions with a variable time coordinate with central symmetry for the spatial structure. And here is, I just put one of these, these things, but all of them are kept, yeah, you know, in Scientific Physics. Yeah. So, yeah, for a decade, yeah, Einstein was not convinced and nobody, nobody paid any attention to Friedman's equation. Of course, yeah, Einstein was convinced that the equations were right, you know, they were mathematically correct, but oh, yes, it is some, some solution that has no importance for physics, no importance for physics. But this thing that the universe, eh, the, the, the radius of the universe eh, could grow, that is this thing that the universe expands. Eh? And no one, no one considered, <laughs> and the, the words of Friedman wrote a second, as you know, in 1924, were considered the case of negative curvature. Yeah, in this one. And it took Einstein 10 years to admit the universe expansion. 10 years. 
Le Maitre was the first, as I have explained so many times, to link uh, Friedman's equations that he reobtained with the, with, with the observational results. And Robertson Walker proved that these Friedman solutions, because Friedman obtained lots of solutions, yeah, but this was the important, yeah, this was the important solution as he realized immediately, but meant a, a universe expanding. This solution is the only one, the only one solution compatible with a universe that satisfies the cosmological principle, yeah, that is homogeneous. Yeah, and isotropic. Yeah, for an homogeneous and isotropic universe, there is only this solution. So we have uh, only one equation, which is Einstein's equation for the universe with only one solution, well, a family, yeah, because the curvature can be positive, negative, or zero. Well, you know this perfectly well. But this was the main thing that happened around Einstein visit. I, this is the two revol I'm finishing, yeah, the two revolutions of modern cosmology that I have explained here sufficiently. Yeah? This is a pivotal episode in the history of physics, of cosmology, and even further of all human history, yeah? in my point of view. Conclusion, Einstein's personal contribution in this specific episode cannot be said to have been as brilliant as on other occasions. But no one can deny that the origin of everything lies in the field equations of his general theory of relativity, eh, worked out by other researchers of a very high level and great intuition. Einstein himself was not able to understand all the consequences of the exceptional theory he had created out of extremely basic and natural principles. It has taken more than 100 years and the dedications of thousands of researchers as you. Eh? What makes me say eh, that despite the weight, which at times may seem infinite, of the great geniuses, progress in knowledge is always, without exception, a collective task. Yeah? So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Emilio. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, there are questions or maybe like discussions, comments that you want to make. Yes. Uh, well, would you elaborate on what you said that you think like Einstein would be better off not, not being so mathematically sound? It's, it's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult to find. It's difficult to find a person who is brilliant in both. Uh, is very difficult, you know. This, I, this is my only comment. You know, it's just uh, experience. <laughs> it's experience. You know, it's uh, it's difficult. You know, uh, to work in both. Uh, maybe there can be some exception, but uh, for me, you know, <laughs> well, Einstein needed the help of mathematicians. Of course, he needed the help of of of, of mathematicians, and. Uh, well, there are yeah, there are some. For instance, Riemann. Yeah? You 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 know Riemann for his mathematics for the for his mathematics. Riemann was also a, a physicist. He has many physics works in physics. Yeah, M many works in physics, but uh, you know the, they are not of, of of the same importance, or not uh, the same considerable importance. Yeah, even he was a physicist, but yeah, yeah who knows Riemann for his physics. It's, it's difficult, yeah. And, and and Riemann is one example that he uh, he was good, yeah. He was good, really good in physics and in mathematics, but it remains only the Riemann mathematician because the man who opened <laughs> the many dimensions of you know it's a real extraordinary field. For me, in my humble experience, maybe the the, the perfect balance was Dirac. Dirac, yeah. Dirac. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Dirac, yes. This was really... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it was really good. 
but in a kind of physics that is based uh, on mathematics, you know, <laughs> is a kind, you know, is a subject, is a, is a, give it a, a region of physics that is, uh, you know, very focused on mathematics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other comments, questions, discussion? Well, of course, we have this event, so we did a lot of things that we can discuss then. Okay. People online? No questions? Okay, so okay. I think that's all. Uh, it's already one. I'm not sure if is the packet uh, available for the pizza. I don't know. I haven't seen. Yeah, we can figure out where we're having the pizza. But uh, let's uh, thank Emilio one more time. Okay, thanks to the people online as well. Yeah. <clears throat>